Good afternoon and welcome to Chats with Jamie. I'm Jamie Franklin, curator at the Bennington Museum. Um, and I've really just enjoyed being able to bring um, these conversations with artists who live and work in our region um, to the museum audience. And today I'm very pleased um, to be um, having a conversation with Mara Superior. Mara is a um, ceramic artist. She works in porcelain, um, hand painting and modeling, um, decorative objects, ceramics, spaces, teapots, um, and we'll see some of that work um, as we um, go on with the conversation. But without any further ado, let me welcome Mara Superior. So welcome, Mara. Um, it's great to see you. Um, it's been a while since I've seen you in person. Um, I think, in fact, the last time, and perhaps the only time we've actually seen each other in person was when I made your studio visit about a year ago. Um, and um, it's really been a pleasure to get to know your work. Um, and as I was actually thinking about our conversation today, um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about these chats is that I, it gives me an opportunity to think about the kind of trajectory of my relationship with a lot of these artists and their work. I actually, I think the first time I ever came across your work was actually at Leslie Farron's gallery um, when it was located down in, um, in Lee, was it Lenox? Um, back in 2005. Um, and so I've actually been following your work perhaps a lot longer than you actually realized. Um, so it's really been a, a pleasure to see your work evolve um, and then to have the opportunity to, to acquire some pieces for the Bennington Museum's collection just last year um, when I made that studio visit. Um, but before we dive into talking about specific works, um, can you just give us a little bit of an introduction to you as an artist and how you came to your practice? Well, um, I've always been an artist. Um, I started as a painter and uh, I'm from New York City and um, went to the High School of Art and Design and went to Hartford Art School and got a BFA in painting and etching and um, married my husband Roy Superior and uh, who's a professor of art and I sort of followed his teaching positions and the reason that I am in western Massachusetts is because he he accepted a position at Hampshire College and um, I discovered ceramics at that time up here in 1979 and um, went to uh, a brief class, hand building with porcelain, a six week class, and decided to go back to the university and study ceramics. And uh, Leslie Farron was one of Roy's students at Hampshire, and that's how we met a very long time ago. I was not interested in the potter's wheel. I was determined not to spend time trying to learn on the wheel. So I started, I thought the slab surface was a perfect a perfect canvas for painting. And and a lot of your work is very much slab built. You know, I, I say decorative objects. Um, I mentioned teapots, platters, you know, we can see the platters on, on the um, cabinet behind you and we'll see some more pictures on the screen. But um, they're not necessarily functional in the traditional sense. They're, you're almost using um, the the forms of traditional decorative arts as, as um, Kind of a a a, a canvas to, on which you you paint imagery and create um, in many of your work very kind of pointed um, um, political and social commentary. So is that something that's that you've always been doing as an artist, particularly with your with your ceramics? I know um, you know one of the the earliest pieces that we acquired in the gift um, to the museum last year, um, which came through the Kohler Foundation. Um, um, was from about 1985, and stylistically, um, the three pieces that we acquired, the, the other two of which we'll see shortly, um, are very um, similar stylistically in the way you approach. So, you know, I, I know it's difficult as an artist um, to kind of talk about, you know, how your, your approach and your style and your kind of, um, how that evolves and begins, but, you know, as that kind of been uh, uh, something that you've been working on from the beginning or has it evolved over time? I, um, I feel like I've been doing this for almost 40 years and um, I do feel my style is idiosyncratic and 
I mean, as far as the content goes, my work is autobiographical and whatever I am currently interested in at any given moment ends up, I express it in porcelain, which is my language. Um, so at the time in the 80s and 90s, I had moved up to New England, um, kicking and screaming and wound up falling in love with New England. And all of the work from that period was uh, the House and Garden series. And it was just basically a love letter to New England. That, that's kind of a perfect segue, actually, to the, this first image that we have to talk about, um, which is a, um, a tile. Um, um, almost like a, a, a plaque that you would hang on the wall, but made of multiple tiles. Kind of reminds me of um, like the Dutch pictorial tiles from the 17th century. Um, but as you can see, it has, it's titled Vermont View. It has a kind of um, um, iconic classic Holstein cow, um, um, which has a little um, speech bubble that's saying, um, it's so green and peaceful here. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your relationship to Vermont? I know you, you have lived and worked in Western Mass for a long time, but this work and, and the other two in kind of um, tangential ways um, relate specifically to kind of the iconography of Vermont as a place. And particularly, and this is my, my kind of personal way that I've thought about this work, you know, I relate it to like the 1980s in popular culture when movies like um, um, baby boom and the funny farm where people were escaping um, the, the urban areas and, and kind of um, corporate jobs and, and escaping to Vermont um, as this kind of idealized pastoral world. Um, and, and it's interesting, as we'll see in, in some of your um, more recent work um, in just a minute, um, it's much more um, politically and socially um, pointed, but I see this idea of your imagery and the pastoral, peaceful image of New England as as having some sort of kind of underlying, maybe I don't want to say satirical commentary, but kind of a commentary on that moment in culture when Vermont and New England was being idealized in a certain way. Um, but that's my personal take on it. So I'd love to hear kind of your own personal relationship with Vermont and how you kind of translated that into your work in porcelain. Well, my relationship with Vermont has to do with my husband Roy's relationship with Vermont. He would often say it was his favorite state and he was a passionate fly fisherman. And from here, um, we are about an hour and a half or two hours from Manchester. And each summer we made at least three pilgrimages to Orvis and, um, and the Fly Fishing Museum in um, Manchester. He was passionate about Vermont and we went frequently. We spent autumn weekends at the Dorset Inn. I visit Brattleboro from time to time. We have dear friends that lived in Dummerston and Whenever we would drive over the border, he'd say, oh, I can breathe. I love this state. This is the most beautiful state. Yep, yep. And why don't we um, just transition now into the, the next slide, um, which is perhaps um, my favorite piece from the three that were part of the Kohler gift. And just to explain that a little bit, the Kohler Foundation, um, the Kohler company, which manufactures um, um, bathroom appliances, toilet sinks, of course, those are made out of ceramics, out of porcelain. Um, I also know them personally because they have, they spend a lot of um, time preserving and conserving um, environmental installations by self-taught artists. So that the, the company as a whole is very invested in the arts and, and, and getting it out into the world. And so um, it was through the Kohler Foundation that um, your three um, pieces were given to the Bennington Museum. But this piece, um, um, it's called the Allure Teapot. It's got images on both sides. The sides we're looking at um, says a dream and it's home sweet. And it's got this kind of iconic 18th, early 19th century New England home or architecture. Um, um, what, what can you tell us about this piece? Well, once again, it's a dreamy, symbolic notion about the dream house. It's, it's in my mind. It's, it's a tribute to domesticity and being excited about having my first home and 
New England vernacular architecture. This is sort of like a shaker house and a symbol. I always loved Egyptology and art, hist art history in general. And um, I think of these, these objects as symbol, symbolic, the symbolic house, the symbolic bird, trees. But and then in many ways, they're life. symbolic objects, true too. I mean, the, you've literally put the teapot, which I, I think maybe technically it could function as a teapot, um, but you've literally placed it on a pedestal um, on this. Um, it's a painted pedestal. It's wooden painted to look like marble. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, not only the imagery on the objects themselves, but the objects as, as objects are, are symbols and icons um, in and of themselves. And, and, and the way you construct them even, it feels that way. They look very flat um, in this image. Um, they do actually have dimension. Um, as I've already mentioned, they're painted on both sides. The other side has a similar um, black and white Holstein as we saw in the image of the black before. Can you just tell us a little bit about kind of your interest in the history of decorative arts? I know when we when we chatted last year, um, the, the iron, the red iron that is um, you use in a lot of your work. Here you see it in the kind of almost eyeball-like uh, motif around the scene and on the handles and the spout. Um, I remember you saying that's a very particular um, um, glaze. Um, and I think of it as, you know, being very uncommon to use those kind of copper-based glazes in the history of ceramics. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, this is copper carbonate, copper oxide, that produces in a specific kind of atmospheric kiln firing these pink flashing effects. And that's what I've been after since I first went to UMass and uh, became familiar with a gas kiln. I fell in love with this particular Grolig porcelain, which is English china clay, literally from England. And it's a ground Cornwall stone glaze. So it, it literally is a piece of English stone. This particular firing method produces these glassy, cool blue effects that are comparable to Chinese export porcelain. So using this, this clay and fire it in, in this manner, I immediately feel as if I can connect the dots back to the beginning of porcelain's history in China, and then the whole fabulous world of porcelain stories getting to Europe. Um, so it's, it's very deep, um, my feeling for these materials. And they're challenging to work with, but it was love at first sight, and I stuck with it my whole career, one glaze and one clay. <laughs> That's, it's been enough to work with. No, and, it's a, and it does, it provides a very distinctive aesthetic, but also it kind of has a material connection to that history. Like you said, it, it feels and looks like 18th century um, European porcelain, Chinese export porcelain, and the motifs that you draw on also um, but you bring it into the 20th and 21st century, which is what I love so much about your work, is the idea that it connects kind of these traditions of the history of ceramics and brings them up to the present day. Um, and just before we move on to our next slide, I'll say that, um, you know, we pre-record these talks, but, and so I don't know the results of our um, People's Choice um, survey. But when we reopen on July to the public on July 3rd, we're going to have a People's Choice Survey. And this teapot was one of, uh, in one of the, um, the sections that people could vote on. So fingers crossed, this may be on view um, when we reopen on July 3rd, which I'm really excited to be able to share your work with our, our museum audience. Um, so why don't we um, just transition to the last still image now. I've already mentioned that um, a lot of your work is very socially and politically pointed. Um, this is um, obviously a very recent work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, you know, your, your political work? And maybe, you know, I'm interested in trying to understand the relationship between, you know, the work, the type of work that we just saw um, and this more political work and just how you see as your role as an artist in kind of, um, you know, expressing your views and sharing them through your own particular medium. I 
just feel as if this is my language, porcelain. And uh, I, I listen to NPR every day in the morning. I listen to classical music all day. And once again, for an hour in the evening, I do listen to the news. And um, I've been disturbed during the past several years with what's been going on politically. And this idea just popped into my mind that the founding fathers must be rolling over in their graves and must be so upset about what's happening to the United States and America right now with this dismantling of the government as I feel it's going in the wrong direction. And for me, the number one problem that we face is the climate crisis. And the combination of all of these problems happening at the same time, the president that we have, the climate change, the pandemic, race riots, the whole situation has just, there's been not much else that I could think about or focus on other than these political works at this time. I really like to go back to dealing with themes that I am more, or that are less uh, charged, but I still need to make beautiful objects. And these are beautiful. And I also think it's interesting to create a beautiful object that has kind of difficult content to draw people in to look at it and um, maybe get them to think about, this is what I can do. This is, you know, my contribution to the problems, um, making this tangible object for history. I love that idea of, of, the, of using beauty to draw people in to kind of these difficult um, issues that we're, we're struggling with as, 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 a, as a nation, as a world. Um, and that's a perfect transition into um, the, the end of our conversation when I, I just like to ask artists, um, um, you know, what have you been working on, on lately? Um, and, you know, we've already, you've already kind of touched on it a little bit, you know, porcelain is your language, it's the way you translate the ideas that are going through your head. And right now, um, there's so much political going on. So um, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on? And I know the piece right here next to you um, is, is one of your most recent works, which is a work on progress. So can you tell us just a little bit about it and maybe a little bit about how you're processing and how you, you work as an artist to process these sorts of current events? This piece was in, it is finished. It is completed. Okay. Uh, it yep. was in the May kiln. And it's, um, I would always thought about, given the nature of my work with animals and so forth, and I'd always imagined I would make a turkey platter someday, but I didn't imagine that it would become this political um, subversive turkey. Um, and it, it, once again, I, am, I was listening to the impeachment hearings in February and I was working on this piece in wet clay. And it's difficult to see it without close-ups, but the turkey, this very vulnerable turkey who is usually in trouble at Thanksgiving time is worried about America and the direction that it's taking. And um, each of these lemons represents one of the Republican senators listening to their responses to the questions during the hearings was hair raising. So I, I have stamped in with lead letters, um, Senator Wrong, Senator, Senator Heartless, Senator Corrupt, Senator Greed, Senator Wicked. So all of these lemons are inscribed with the Senator's character. And um, here I write, which is from a, an article that I saw in the New York Times at that time, Zombies, Monsters, and Senate Republicans, February 5th, 2020, which is the day of the acquittal. To me, democracy is in danger. Here I have written Trump and Putin on one side encroaching and democracy on this side, hopefully vote in 2020. And that's all we can do. It's the most powerful tool that we have as a we the people to change things that we don't like. And um, we can do it.
democracies can change. And the most crucial thing is that everybody gets everyone and drives their grandmothers and their teenagers and everyone that has the right to vote to vote this time. It must be a landslide and we must change things. Well, thank you so much for taking your time to share your work with us. And um, um, like I said, fingers crossed, um, your work will hopefully be on view when we reopen on July 3rd. And um, thank you again. Um, it was really a pleasure speaking. My pleasure. Thank you, Jamie.